the benefit of people having such diametrically opposing yeah. views within a society, besides making us angry at each other, is? Well, you know, who knows who's right and who's wrong? Why do we have such deeply conflicting core values, even when we come from the same families, the same communities? I've never understood how we can be so different. Theoretically, the, the nurture element should influence it, I, I always thought, completely. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it doesn't. I mean, the nurture element of it seems to influence it far less than we thought. Um, the, the genetic data pertaining to nurture shows that the shared environment that people inhabit actually has very little effect on their long-term life outcome. So that would be the fact that you grew up in the same family. Mm -hmm. Now that might be partly because if you're in a good family, the relationship you have with your parents is so unique and individual that it doesn't really generalize to the relationship that your siblings had with your parents. Right. You know, and so partly what you might be doing in a good family is actually maximizing the genetic differences between your children because you're allowing them to manifest themselves the way they are and encouraging that, you know, with, with some exceptions. Why are we so different? Well, we, we're, we're, we're different because we, we, we're, we're composed of biological subsystems that have a substantial amount of variability in their operation. And, though, and there are reasons for that. The reasons are that some configurations of these biological systems are better suited for some environments and some configurations are better suited for some other environments. And when you're born, you don't know which environment you're going to be thrown into. So, you know, God rolls the dice and there you get your temperament. <laughs> and so the biological systems seem to aggregate into five core differences. There's extroversion. Extroverted people are assertive and enthusiastic. They like groups. They like parties. They are energized by people, whereas introverts are better on their own. Mm -hmm. And there's people who are high or low in neuroticism. That's the negative emotion dimension. Extroversion is a positive emotion dimension. And people who are higher in neuroticism are more sensitive to uncertainty and anxiety and emotional pain. And you might say, well, why is that useful? And the answer to that, I think, is twofold, is that, first of all, maybe you're going to be born in dangerous times and you should be alert for predators. You know, and, and there's another reason, too. Women tend to have higher scores in negative emotion than men. And I think there's three reasons for that. I think they become sexually vulnerable at puberty, and that's when the temperamental differences kick in. They're smaller physically, so the world is actually more dangerous. But most importantly, I think that women's nervous systems are not optimized for women. I think they're optimized for woman-infant dyads because you have to be very threat responsive and sensitive to negative emotion if you're going to take proper care of an infant. And I say, so I think women pay a price, the price of increased susceptibility to depression and anxiety for their heightened sensitivity to the distress of infants. And so, well, that's how it is. And, you know, you might say, well, those differences in negative emotion are sociocultural, but that's wrong because if you look at the egalitarian societies of Scandinavia, for example, in Northern Europe, the differences between men and women in these traits is actually larger than it is in the rest of the world. So what seems to happen is that as you remove the sociocultural constraints for men and women, the genetic differences m maximize. And so that, that's a very complicated problem, and no one's come to terms with that. And just to be clear, the benefit of people having such diametrically opposing yeah. views within a society, besides making us angry at each other, is? Well, you know, who knows who's right and who's wrong? It's like, let's say you have an employee who isn't turning out very well, and you have an agreeable manager, because that's another dimension associated with compassion and politeness, you have a disagreeable manager. And the disagreeable manager says, we got to get rid of this person. They're pulling everyone's performance down. We're not going to meet our targets this term because of it. We've given them, let's say, several chances. And um, it's not an appropriate business decision to continue. And the agreeable person says, you're failing to take the context into consideration. Um, the person is dealing with a, like a parent who has Alzheimer's and a spouse who's got an alcohol problem and they're doing their best to continue working and if we fire them then we're going to send a message to all of our other employees that we're not caring. Mm -hmm. 
It's like, well, who's right? Well, you don't know who's right. You need that diversity of opinion, you know, because either of those stories could be correct, and sometimes one of them is correct and sometimes the other is correct. And so part of the diversity is, and, and it's part of the way that human beings are able to fit into so many niches, is that many, the answer to the problems that are posed by many situations are far from obvious and that a diversity of opinion is actually necessary to address them properly. We live, in a, we live in a world where you'll hear one of those stories and not the other. Mm -hmm. You only hear the story about the missed target or the guy's Alzheimer's mom. You mm -hmm. won't hear both stories. Mm -hmm. And as we begin to make decisions based on only hearing one part of the story, we get more and more angry at the folks who don't agree with us. So mm -hmm. what does, for example, the Trump election and other similar elections that we've seen around the world teach us about what's going on? Well, I would say what the Trump election taught us primarily was that it was dangerous to, for the Democrats to abandon the working class in favor of identity politics. And this has to do with identity politics is, is essentially predicated on the idea that your fundamental nature is determined by some obvious group characteristic, your sex, your ethnicity, your race, your gender, that's another one that's been added, and that you're fundamentally an avatar of that group. And that wasn't a position, because of its ra radical anti-individualism, I would say, that wasn't a position that was popular among Americans. And so Trump squeaked by, at least in part because of that. Uh, that and the fact that I think that the classic Democrats, the working class types, felt abandoned by the Democrat move towards identity politics as opposed to their, their, their general work for the working class. And with that decision, now we have other issues that are coming to the forefront. Maybe they were there all along, but uh, things like immigration. Yeah. And this issue of borders, yeah. which has been much more divisive than I thought because we've had challenges to our immigration policy for a long time. But uh, most of us don't see the other side of this equation. Yeah. Explain why borders themselves are so important to our societies, and not just the United States, but around the world. Countries are making decisions that seem seemingly fly in the face of what's in their best interest as an individual to vote for a government that will support that borders issue. Well, how big a territory do you think you can manage? That's a big part of the... That's the Tower of Babel problem. You know, if you, you can easily make an organization so large that it can no longer govern itself. It starts to fractionate from within. And, and that's, a, that's a major permanent problem. And I think it's the problem that the European economic community is suffering from. It's very hard as your organization scales. It's very difficult to have it not fragment and fracture within. It's very difficult to not have its lower strata alienated from its top strata. So, so, so there, there's, a, there's a gigantism problem with the idea of border, of border-free world, let's say. Mm -hmm. It's like one world, one government? W what exactly does that mean? That's a steep hierarchy with very few people in charge. You know, very difficult to organize that so that, I mean, the UN hasn't been able to manage it in 40 years of trying. And mm -hmm. so part of the advantage of a border is that you can take this relatively secluded space and organize it half reasonably so the people who exist within it can exist, you know, in a certain amount of harmony. Now, the price you pay for that is that you exclude people. Well, that's the price you pay for borders. It's the price you pay for hierarchies. And you can argue about the cost of exclusion. And, and you should argue about it. But the solution shouldn't be, well, we don't need borders. It's like, it, it's not thought through. You have walls in your bedroom. You have walls in your house. You know, sometimes you have walls in your community. Or at least you have demarcations, right? And so everyone already understands that we have to exist within spaces that are somewhat protected and defined. Why is it metaphorically so important? I mean, when these kinds of topics become major dividers in our politics, mm -hmm. it's often more than the issue itself. Yeah. So what are they yeah. seeing that we're missing? I mean, there are, again, quite well, a few people have been elected oh, only one. on the issue of immigration. Yeah, well, the thing is, there's two, there's two ways of looking at the foreigner. One is as a source of contamination. And that would be physiological contamination and also moral or 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 philosophical contamination. So the physiological contamination would be 
bearers of illness. So there's a great study, there's a couple of great studies published a few years ago showing, this was amazing studies, man, showing that the higher the rate of transmissible disease in the state or country studied, the more likely the culture was to be authoritarian at that level of analysis. And that held within countries, between the provinces in the countries and across countries. And the correlation wasn't small. And so, and it's been historically the case that when isolated human populations mix, there is always the problem of the transmission of illness. It happened with the Black Plague, right? It happened with the decimation of the Native Americans in the Western Hemisphere. We figured we might have lost 95% of them as a consequence of the contact with Europeans. So there's danger in encountering the foreigner. And so the conservative types, who are more disgust sensitive and more orderly, more wall focused, they think, look, let's err, let's err on the side of caution. Things are pretty good here. Minimal contact with the stranger. Um, it's a safer route. And the liberals say, yeah, yeah, that's all well and good. But look, without some new ideas, we're going to get all stagnant here and tyrannical. And we're going to fall behind. And so we better open the borders so that we can have a free flow of ideas so that everybody can become richer and smarter. And they're also right. But the problem is they're both right. Yes. Right? They're both right. Is there's the viral problem, so to speak, and, and that can be physiological as well as in ideological and intellectual. Yeah. Ideas can contaminate you. Oh, of course, of course. Ideas sweep. Well, look what happened to, to the Soviet Union when the Marxist ideas came sweeping through, or Maoist China, for that matter. I mean... Ideas have a viral quality, and they're not trivial. And so the, the border, the, 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 the tall border people think, hey, caution. And the permeable border people think, yeah, well, your caution is just going to cause stagnation. And the issue is, it's, again, it's the same problem. Um, they're both right. It's the problem with temperaments in general, is that it depends on the circumstances. So you have to have an argument. Is this a time to open the borders or to shut them? Well, well, essentially, you want both. You actually want both those groups fighting over it because the truth's not going to be at either end of that experience. That's, that's right, and because the truth is going to continue to vary. So what has allowed political leaders who have been able to offer one extreme to succeed? Is it because well, such a stark... Well, I, I think part of what happened in the Trump election was that the level of general distrust in in... American society rose substantially because of political polarization. And I think that was part of what drove the, the desire for the wall, is that as distrust rises and uncertainty rises, the, the requirement for predictable order necessarily increases. I get it. That's why you mentioned the viruses. The countries with lots of infections in them, whether it's ideological yep. or true viral. Yeah. They tend to get more conservative in terms of their wall management. Yes, yes. Yeah, and they, get, and they get authoritarian. And the correlation is not trivial. In these papers, the correlation, that's, and that's the indicator of the strength of the relationship between the two variables, it was up to 0.6. It was the determining factor, you know. And, well, I mean, why would that be? Well, let's say that some of the diseases are transmissible through sexual contact. Well, so what do you do about that? Well, obviously, what you do about that is you clamp down on sexual freedom. That's going to be part of a, the authoritarian ethos. Yeah. And sometimes that is what you do because there are viral forces afoot and it's time to batten down the hatches and to isolate yourself. But other times, well, it's time to open up because there's new things to learn. And so it is part of the eternal debate between the liberal types and the conservative types. And you can never say... That's why, the, that's why the, the utopia in American politics is the politics. It's not the liberals winning, and it's not the conservatives winning. Because the conservatives will win for a while, and then they'll be wrong. Mm -hmm. And then the liberals will take over, and they'll be all right for a while, and then they'll be wrong. It's the dynamic, and, and it's, the, it's the dynamic that's mediated by free, the free speech of sovereign individuals that keeps the interplay between the opposition s centering us on the best approximation of reality we can man manage. It's a dynamic process. It's also partly the problem with the idea of political utopia, because you think, well, now the problem's solved. It's like, no, the damn problem's never solved because the ground keeps shifting underneath your feet. So you, the, the, pro the, the solution is to dance. The solution is to surf. Right? Yeah. And, and you, you maintain your stability that way. 
but it's not because it's permanent. Well, we'll keep dancing. Dr. Peterson, thank you.